All right. Hello and welcome to another Arm Innovation Coffee, where the coffee is hot and the innovation is hotter. Like what I did there. <laughs> uh, my name is Robert Wolf. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, my name is Robert Wolf, joined by my co-host here, Alessandro Grande. And in today's episode, we'll be meeting with Dominic, B Dominic Binks, VP of Technology at Audio Analytic, who will be chatting to us about ML in the use of audio applications among other things, of course. As a reminder, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the ARM Software Developers YouTube channel. And if you have any questions throughout this stream, just drop them in the chat and we'll get them get to them as soon as possible. So as we usually do before meeting our guest, it's time to do a little recap of last week's episode. So I'll let Alessandro go ahead and take that away. Yes. Hi, Robert. Thank Hi. you for, for the Cheers. introduction. Cheers. And yes, uh, not yesterday, actually, last week, we had um, a, a really interesting episode on uh, machine learning again. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in the, in the space, go watch that as well. Uh, it was an episode with the, NG, the Edge Impulse team and um, Raspberry Pi. Uh, and we talked about how um, Edge Impulse actually uh, start, created a new feature to enable you to do machine learning on a Raspberry Pi and a Jetson Nano last week. Um, so it was interesting to talk to the to both teams and see how uh, developers are starting to use all these tools and and really starting to um, come up with interesting use cases in uh, in this space. And today again, we're going to talk more about ML and uh, uh, some of the really interesting work that Audio Analytic is doing. So I'm really excited for that. And Robert, is there anything else that I've missed? I think that's good. Yeah, last week was very exciting, uh, and we get to kind of continue on with that whole ML train so let's do it let's let's bring on our guest i think it's time yeah yeah one thing one thing we should mention is that his name is actually dominic binks not <laughs> pink but uh you know i think now everybody knows him as mr pink as well <laughs> we, we already have a, a comment from in the chat so dominic <laughs> uh dominic binks vp of audio uh, sorry vp of technology at audio analytic getting my my title wrong there welcome to the show uh, Hello, Sandro, hi, Robert. How are you? Great, thank you. Welcome. We're thank excited. You, welcome. Yeah, and look, I'm wearing a, a kind of pink T-shirt. Our logo's got pink. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Yeah, we got one comment already from someone that I guess saw the tweet, right? So we didn't want to mention it again, but I guess I guess <laughs> the tweet has been seen by others. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things about tweets is that they do actually get seen by people, strangely enough. <laughs> and you can't modify them, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it, once it's out there, it's out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're really glad to have you on the show today and uh, thank you for joining. You. And I'm really excited for uh, all the stuff that you have sh to share with us today. Um, before, before, you know, getting started and asking you all these questions, we want to give you, as usual, some time to introduce yourself. So please, Dominic, it's your sp space to introduce yourself. Right. OK. Um, well, I grew up in Sheffield. Um, I went to the University in Bristol, studied computer science. Uh, I did a PhD in program debugging. That will come back in, I think. Um, and then I got my first job. I was a startup. It did pretty well. I did pretty well. I moved over to this side of the country, had a few jobs, and ended up at Audio Analytic. Um, and one other thing is that I'm a musician, which will also come back in later. Interesting. Nice. So, Robert, sorry. I was just going to say, should we should we ask Dominic more questions right away, or should we do the special I, thing? Yeah, so I actually I I like starting the episodes off with a bit of an icebreaker. So I you know, and we were talking to Dominic before the show uh, in the green room, of course. That he has something a little different to share with us. So I, I think we start with the segment. Let's do a little icebreaker here, and I'll let you click the button, Alessandro. <laughs> That's a new one. Ooh. Have we show, have we showed that one yet? I don't think we have. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation Coffee Cribs. Cool. So yeah, in this segment, what we do is we uh, let our guests show us a little bit around their house, some of the things that are off the camera. And Dominic, you had some books uh, behind the camera that we can't see, um, yeah. among a few other things that you were going to share with us. Yeah. So the, the, I got like three shelves and, and one of them is completely full of books, but I've got I've got too many books, so um, I've got some books here. I said I did a, program, a PhD in program debugging. Um, so uh, I've got Andrew Stella, Why Programs Fail, uh, 
Debug It, written by a friend of mine, Paul Butcher. One of my favourite books, actually, is this one called De Debugging by David Agans. It's a really, really good book. Well worth reading if you ever do any debugging, which is probably true for every software engineer ever. Um, and uh, it, it's really easy to read. It's quite entertaining. And I believe if you hunt around on the internet, you can probably find a copy of it there. I've also got other bits and pieces of stuff, like I've got a little board. And I've got a Jetson Nano. Um, I've got all kinds of crap. got a pair of headphones and all those pairs of in-ear monitors. All sorts of things on my desk. Um, the stuff behind you, that's nothing to do with me. That's my wife's stuff. So. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. And so I, I think what we'll try to do for, you know, all, all the viewers out there, maybe you can provide us links to these or these books or give us just kind of a list of what you showed in case someone is interested in, in going yeah, yeah. and pers you want pursuing. Now or you want it after the show? No, after the show. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll, we'll throw them in the description. And Dominic, I think while we're talking about books, you, you, you shared something earlier that I think some, some of the people watching this might be interested in knowing as well. Uh, something about Cambridge University actually uh, allowing you to buy some books that they've got in their in the libraries. Can you share that with everyone? Yeah, so it's not in the library. It's actually, came, so on Market Square in Cambridge uh, is the Cambridge University Press Bookshop. Now, sometimes it's there. And it, it, the last couple of years, uh, it moved up to Green Street where they hired a shop. And basically, in early January, it's about the 10th of January, they have their book sale where they sell off books that don't have, that maybe have got damaged slightly or have got a printing error somewhere. Or, um, and they sell the hardbacks for seven quid and the paperbacks for three quid. And, and I mean, just, I don't know. Let me, here's quite a meaty book that I've got up here, which I bought. Um, there you go. Continuous. And discrete time signal systems, which would retail for, I don't know, lots of money, uh, for seven quid. Um, the, re the real challenge is, is not spending large amounts of money and then remembering to take a bag so you can carry the books back home with you. Um, <laughs> but obviously it's not been happening because of COVID, but um, um, hopefully next year it'll be on again. So Aisha Jr. is actually asking something or say, suggesting something um, <laughs> to, to our non-UK audience. We might have to explain what quid means. What's a quid? Uh, right. Okay, so a quid is <laughs> one pound sterling. It's like saying a buck when you mean a dollar. It's it's the same thing. It's yeah, same. I, I I ran into that uh, when when I started my first job with an international company. Uh, it was also based out of Cambridge, and when we would do our ret retreats or when we would meet for conferences, you know, all the British folks they would be like, "Hey, you know, oh, that was about three quid. That was about ten quid." I'm like, Gosh, "What's a quid? I got to go on Google real quick and <laughs> find this out so I don't look like a fool." But yeah, um, it's like a buck. That's that's interesting. That's cool. So, um, Dominic, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, your books and 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 those cool things. Uh, moving on now into the section here, the the, the, the meat of this live stream. Um, I think it's still important to get to know a little bit more about you, but I'd like to also trickle in, of course, what is Audio Analytic, the company that you work for and are here representing. So the questions here are, Dominic, could you share a little bit more of a background around your career and what got you interested in machine learning? while also telling us a bit more about audio analytic, what you guys do and how you got there. Right, yeah, so um, I guess, as I say, I, I moved to this side of the country, I had, I had a couple of jobs, uh, and I ended up working at, uh, at one of these, uh, at a, a big American firm called Qualcomm, who many people will know, some people won't know, but they make the modems that go in phones and they also make smartphone chips and they do a bunch of other stuff. Um, I uh, ended up uh, at one point, um, uh, in 2009, actually moving to San Diego and working in the Android team in, in San Diego. Um, and then we decided to come home uh, uh, in 2012. Uh, and I continued working for Qualcomm for a little while, working on augmented reality, um, uh, working on actually on, on um, Apple phones and, and uh, iPads, um, which was interesting, but it, it didn't really excite me that much. But it, it was a, it was a nice job of working with people I liked. And then a friend of mine posted a message on Facebook saying, uh, and she she's actually one of the um, on the board of Audio Analytics, saying there was this opening in Audio Analytics. And I mentioned that I was a musician, and this seemed like a really a great opportunity to combine my love of of programming and and computing with the area of sound. I could use 
by experiences in both to kind of I felt augment this company and, and do some stuff interesting things the machine learning thing was 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 a little bit of a, a sort of uh, a kind of one of those things on the side it wasn't something that I was necessarily really looking for um but as I've been there and that was uh 2013 I joined audio analytics it, it's it's kind of grown on me the whole machine learning thing what an audio analytic do is in this kind of strap line -y brief way is we're giving machines a sense of hearing if you think about sound or the, the the ability to hear it's a primary sense and um if you actually stop and think for a few moments about what could a machine do if it could hear um well obviously we know that machines can respond to us in meaningful ways if we use certain keywords and then say something uh speakers then start telling us things or playing music at us or whatever it is we ask it to do until we ask it something slightly complicated and then they get really, really confused. Um, but if you could have uh, uh, some kind of device that could hear the world around you and hear truck traversing or people crying or, you know, books falling off walls, as many happen in my room, uh, you know, what, what could we do? What, could, what kind of things could we, so what kind of experiences, user experiences could we start to uh, create with this ability to hear the world around us? We also, um, I mean, originally the company was involved with uh, professional security, which is not a particularly exciting area to be in. But one of the really, really important things to think about is um, if something happens out of camera and a security camera, it didn't happen. But if you could hear that it happened, then maybe it did happen. Uh, and so that was kind of like the starting point for where we, we, we kind of started. I mean, there was always a bigger idea of you could do interesting things if you could detect sounds in the environment um but that's kind of where it started and and we're working in lots of different areas doing you know applying the technology of sound recognition to uh uh various different applications from mobiles hearables smartphone all sorts of things very interesting um you know what comes to mind is that uh, you, you mentioned sound in connection with, or you know, kind of in conjunction with, um, for example, smart cameras, right? You know, what comes to mind is really perception, right? The concept of you know, giving machines the ability to uh, to experience the world around them, right? I wonder, you know, you spe you specifically said audio analytics focuses on sound. Do you have to like also kind of um, make your things work with the rest of the system, or do you just introduce your um, your piece of code or your model? inside something that's already working and you don't have any kind of um way of interacting with the rest of the system um we up to press we haven't done that much we haven't had the opportunity to do that much but there is a lot of enthusiasm for doing and in integrating sound recognition with other sensing capabilities be they images or motion or all sorts of things um it's clear that if you can combine these then you you get a whole new level of understanding of the world around you in, in inside the computer brain if you like so so i have two two questions one comment i shot jr one of our community members here beat me to it but it's funny you said like you know if you don't see it did it really happen if you hear it did it did it happen it, it brings me back to the old saying you know if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it did it happen i shot jr put a nice little spin on this if a tree falls in the woods and no ml classifies it <laughs> Did it really fall? Um, very interesting. My, my main question here, though, is you mentioned about, uh, you know, audio analytics here. I mean, it's a company, Audio Analytic. Um, are you just focused on analyzing the sound or do you also focus on analyzing direction? So directional sound by, you know, taking in multiple inputs and stuff like that. Or is this just strictly trying to analyze the waves themselves? Um, it's a really interesting question. Actually, it's one I asked really. <laughs> When I first interviewed at Audio Analytic, yeah, the answer is no, we are not doing um, directional stuff. Um, that's not because we don't want to. It's just we haven't actually got to a point where it, it's needed. But I think, you know, that it's very obvious that if you can do directional you know, location and that, that camera example, you know, you could pinpoint where the sound was, particularly if you've got several cameras that may none of them be looking in the right direction, but actually they could still pinpoint where it was. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't done it because um, it's just not been been a requirement of what we where we've been heading at the time. Yeah. So before we split off from this this topic here, because we did also talk about you and your introduction into audio analytic, 
Um, I shot JR brought up this question. I have two questions from the audience already. We'll see if we even get past this background check here. Um, what kind of music do you make? Uh, I guess uh, if you were gonna uh, try and position it, it, it's kind of in the prog rock space. It's kind of Rush and Marillion, if you know those bands. Um, that's kind of those are my uh, favorite bands. Uh, very, very cool. Very cool. Um, and then this one is uh, leaning more on the tech side. Um, if from Alan Robertson here, if ML is trained to determine frequencies, uh, D sharp example, um, is it more power power efficient than a fast Fourier transform calculation? Yeah, that's quite an easy one. No, no. Okay, there you go. The, 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 uh, an FFT is a super optimized way of determining frequencies from time signals. So, you know. You can train an ML model to do it, but it will not be as good or as efficient, as energy as efficient. So, I mean, anybody, I mean, this is no secret, right? All the um, speech recognition guys, all the sound, rec all people that are doing sound recognition, pretty much without failure do an FFT first. There are a few people that are doing it directly from the waveform, but it, it it's relatively uncommon. And when we get to talk about the, the, uh, the tiny ML piece, um, the reality is with tiny ML, uh, not to jump in too much for a idea, but no, that's uh, fine. Actually, let's, let's move on to that topic actually. So, you know, what got you interested in tiny ML and what are you doing with tiny ML? Well, I, a tiny ML. So, so I mean, I don't know if it's worth just kind of quickly saying what tiny ML is, um, because, uh, maybe not everyone's familiar with this term. It's just kind of a, a name for a thing rather than a concept in, uh, uh, uh kind of theory. So TinyML is really the application of machine learning to um, devices that are small and typically edge and compute and resource limited. So typically you think about microcontrollers, perhaps physically distant from a network or very low bandwidth network connections. Do machine learning uh, inference on those and sensing things that are around, obviously like sound, but vibrations, um, images to a degree, uh, movement, all sorts of things you can sense uh, from a sensor. You can do some machine learning on it, and you can start to detect things that are of interest. Um, because they're on microcontrollers and they tend to be, as I say, physically remote or at length from a network, you're wanting to do it at low power levels. You're wanting to do it. And so when we, when we go back to the FFT question, the answer is FFTs are a very efficient way of extracting features uh, from audio uh, in terms of frequency analysis. So it, it's unlikely that you're going to want to use a waveform-based model because of the fact that it's just likely to prove more costly than you can justify on those kind of devices. Cool. So we talked about uh, machine learning in general and, and TinyML. You mentioned that uh, you know, you've got an interest in TinyML. Uh, we should mention that actually me and you are part of the uh, TinyML UK committee, and we just had an awesome talk uh, Tuesday, actually, by Massimo Banzi. Uh, let's put that link on the. I've got it here. Did I? Do I have it? No, I, we don't have it here, actually. Uh, oh, because it's not. It's not actually available yet. Yes. So you, if you go to the YouTube Tiny ML um, channel, you can find it. It's going to come out in the next few days if you haven't watched it. Um, but actually, my question was was actually, you come from a, a software background, right? And uh, software debugging, and then you move into the ML space. And one question that I get asked a lot is, you know, or maybe perhaps like one comment is really around ML is is a lot, is very different from normal, um, you know, software development. I wonder what your take on that is, you know, what is, what are the main differences and it, are, there, are there real differences in the approaches and, and uh, yeah, and in and, and the way you actually go about it? It's a great question, Alessandro. And the answer that I give is 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 possibly heretical to the machine learning community. Um, I I think it is different. It is definitely different. But I think it's not as different as sometimes people make out it is. Um, so let, let's look at how it is different. Um, well, first of all, with machine learning, uh, what you tend to end up with is a very very small amount of code, um, because generally speaking. The machine learning model is a, a inference engine is 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 really just a very small piece of code. It doesn't need to be big because it doesn't. It's not doing a lot of different things. It's just doing one thing a lot. 
Um, and uh, although you might, if you've had any playing with TensorFlow, you might just disagree with that statement. <laughs> but um, uh, the the big thing about machine learning is that essentially, instead of writing code, you use data and you learn information from data. Uh, and so you need a lot of data. Uh, whatever you're doing, you just need lots and lots of data. And um, the issue is that um, if you look at the problem, it's not it's different from traditional software engineering in in some respects, but it doesn't mean it's different in how you go about solving the actual challenge. So, I mean, most of us in the software industry have transitioned to this thing called agile, this model where basically you you do short bursts of work and you kind of group regroup every every so often and look at where you've gone usually you know two three weeks something like that and and you look at where you've got to and you look at where you're going and when you realize that you actually go a bit like that or you need to change direction to go like that you know that you can make those course adjustments before you've set in a real load of work on yourself to actually go and undo and then redo um well actually that that works really well with machine learning type tasks because generally what we've found when we've been doing work with sound and i don't believe this is any different from people who are doing work with any other type of machine learning is you do some work you do some gathering of data you train some models and then you discover that the data you've got isn't quite adequate for what you're trying to do so you need to go and get some more data or you label it perhaps as intelligently as you could when you started but you're now realizing that in fact the labeling that you applied wasn't quite right and that you need to relabel it. And, and because you if you work in an agile manner, these kind of short bursts of time allow you to kind of go, ah, right, okay, well, we were not quite where we wanted to be, and we see that there's been this problem, and now we need to go and fix it. We go back, we go around again, we come out. Um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor, I won't I won't go into the details of what we're actually doing because it's confidential, but we we started a project at the beginning of the year um, that involved collecting data and labeling data. I was in the meeting a couple of days ago, we we're having a, a retrospective on it. And one of the NL guys said, we spent two weeks training models. That was the model train time. The rest of the time was collecting the data, labeling it, evaluating it, making sure that it met our needs and it was reporting what we needed to do. And just going around that loop and understand. I mean, there was a certain degree of understanding the actual problem space because we were doing something slightly new, which we've not done before. So there was a certain element of that as well. But the actual core, we're going to train models. We're going to look at the results. We're going to train more models. We're going to look at the results. That was two weeks of work. Now, I'm not saying that had we had six months, we wouldn't have spent longer. But I just want to make the point that actually the model training side is actually a relatively small a part of that whole cycle of work. Thank so, you for the answer. Yeah, so so I think this may, maybe touches on or provides a good segue into this next question. And uh, Caesar, Caesar, we do see your question in there, so I'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but this is one of my favorite topics, of course, talking about the developers out there. Um, and so this addresses kind of opportunities and challenges. What are the opportunities and challenges developers are facing today? And you did just talk about how a group of people with a, a you know, a company that has money spent weeks collecting data, you know, like what kind of, what kind of challenges and opportunities or what kind of challenges are developers facing today? And then what kind of opportunities, if you know of any, uh, might you present to these developers? Okay. So, um, Let's let's just let's just be clear. I go, going back to the whole ML piece, and, and in a sense, why why I'm perhaps more enthusiastic about it than when I you know started doing ML things, is that if you have some information, some data somewhere, you can do machine learning on it. Um, and if you have a reason to be able to want to find information or or make some autonomous decisions or semi-autonomous decisions based on that data, then ML is how you do it. Machine learning is the way. Um, which opens up a whole range of, of, of options. And, and the great thing about ML is that, of course, you never actually have to be right. You only have to be mostly right, um, which is unlike software, where you always have to be right. Um, so for the, the opportunities are that there are many, many areas where machine learning techniques can be applied and deliver value. 
So there's a huge opportunity. I think the challenges are um, we're getting better at the tools that actually do the learning and do the inference. I think that, that area we're, we're developing, I mean, there are lots and lots of runtime engines, TensorFlow like Micro, there's the Edge Impulse guys, there's Kixo, there's a whole bunch of people that are doing this kind of thing. They also provide um, some tools for doing data collection. But I think that the data collection piece is the one that is particularly grueling at the moment. And I think the reason is that um, the data we work with is often not as clean as we'd like it. And sometimes, and, and certainly we've encountered this, that actually we're not entirely completely certain when we start something, what data we even need. Um, and so we end up, you know, going around in circles or, or, or just not, not making as much progress as we'd like um, because we're still understanding the space. Now, if you're taking something that's really, yeah, well trodden, like image recognition, there's a lot of research in, there's a lot of solutions out there, then you can probably get something fairly useful fairly quickly because there's models, structures that will work well, there's lots of labeled data, you can get going quite quickly. But if you take a, a different area, it, it can be quite challenging to, to sort of make progress. Very interesting. So on that topic of data, right, um, given your background on uh, on you know, debugging, I wonder how do you validate whether your data is actually the right data or or not, right? Or whether it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, you mentioned before, you know, like you could be um, using the wrong data or you might have labeled the data wrong. So how do you validate, how do you go about validate, validating the data? It, it, it's really difficult, uh, and I think it's one. It's it's something that you uh, that you you get better at with experience. Um, uh, but the thing is that what you need to do is you need to understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve. This will help you. So, in in sound recognition, which is the area which I'm obviously strongest in, um, if you wanted to recognize a sound at say 20 meters distance, that was important for the product we were trying to build then you need to collect data that's 20 meters distance because collecting at 10 meters isn't gonna tell you the same thing. And you can't just assume that the laws of physics behave completely nicely. Um, yes, we know what sound does as it gets further away from the source, but unless you're gonna model the entire world and its reflections and things, it becomes more complicated. So it's just it turns out it's just actually easier to collect the data in situ in most cases, there are some cases where it's it, it just not practical. Um, but to give you an indication of the kinds of things that um, uh, we deal with, you know, we smash windows because you can't reproduce the sound of a smashing window through a loudspeaker, for example. It just doesn't work. It's a different sound phenomenon that causes it. If you want to know more about that, there's a, there's a great presentation by my colleague, Dr. Sasha Krasilovich from uh, with the Harvard Tiny Mail course, where he talks about data collection. He talks about how the sound of a breaking window is not the same as in, as the sound of a violin or a speech or almost any other thing that you can produce through a loudspeaker. If you um, if sorry, you ever need if you ever need help, you know, like smashing windows and cups and plates and stuff, just give me a call. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll cruise on over there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, used to, we used to do gunshot detection as well. And I mean, you're clearly, clearly not this side of the pond, but, um, you know, for us, you know, going to fire guns was kind of quite an exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please. No, continue. no, no, it's fine. I, I, I just think that, that I think that it, when you understand what the use case is, you can start to hone in on the data that you need. Um, you need to ensure you have traceability. That's one of the things that that, that is quite, quite difficult. And this is one of those areas where I think, you know, developers with a bent have an opportunity that so so let me give you an example when we're recording we record typically in quite long periods say half an hour when you're breaking windows you turn the recording equipment on you just leave it on so the breaks just happen at various different points throughout the recording um when you actually start to process it, you need to break out all the bits that don't have break windows in so you end up with the actual breaks as, as separate pieces and then you start to label um all that stuff you've got to trace back because you've got to find out, you know, for example, you know, we've had it happen that, you know, we, I mean, we've, we use um, 
reference microphones. Reference microphones are about, they cost us about £3,000 each. They're expensive bits of kit. And um, turns out one of them at one point had a damaged microphone. And so it was producing wrong results. And, and so you need to be able to trace back and figure out all the things that you did with that device that now is suspect because you don't know that the results are actually correct. Those is, kinds of, uh, is this uh, because, a, sorry, sorry. I was going to say, is this because all of that data already made it into your data set? And so, you know, when you're talking about just t gigabytes, if anything, terabytes of data, and you need to go find exactly that one instance where you went out, you collected this data, and now it's just jumbled into this huge pile of data, and you need exactly. to remember yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I mean, with things like GDPR as well, and, and also the, the EU Commission is now looking at restricting AI usages, you, you, you do need to be able to trace back this. Yeah. So let me just give you a, a, another example. Supposing I, I had some recordings of yours, Robert, and you said, Actually, you know, audio analytic, it's been nice, but I don't want you to have those recordings anymore, which you're allowed to do under GDPR. Um, we would then have to go and remove those. And we'd have to remove every single file that may have come from those. So if we, as we do, we record in people's homes 24 seven, and then they come around and say, actually, no, we don't want you to have that. If we've got recording of a cat meow that was taken from, you know, two weeks of recording in someone's home, which we're removing. We've got to be able to chase those things down. And that that's a real, you know, that's, that requires some, some heavy engineering. It's not ML stuff. It's just regular software engineering, the kind of boring stuff that, that pays lots of people's wages. Very interesting. <clears throat> Thank you. That, that was a good explanation. Thank you. Dominic, we've, we've talked a bit about sound, right? But we haven't uh, addressed one of the questions that I think is, is key for me in understanding uh, you know this space, right? Uh, you, you're you're in a bit of a of a I guess niche space because not many people or not many companies are doing actual sound recognition. I'm curious, what is the difference between sound recognition and speech recognition? Uh, that is what you what what I hear about more often. Actually, uh, any details on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's you know it's a kind of natural thing to assume that they're similar because they're both sound and you're both extracting some kind of information from them. But, but they're actually quite different. They start off the same. Um, so the question about an FFT uh, to start with, uh, you know, both the speech guys and we do FFTs. Um, and, then, and then we start to get features, uh, which might be the, the power uh, spectrum or uh, other features. Um, log mail filter banks are very popular across all sorts of sound and audio type applications. Um, and for those people who you know, very brief understanding of log mail, um, log mail filter banks, mail frequencies are basically frequencies which we perceive as higher, and 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 they're they're it's just a, a different scale to standard frequency. Um, and but then things start to go a bit different because um, with if you think about what it's, uh, the speech recognition is doing, it, it is breaking down sound into phonemes and then it's constructing phonemes into words and then words into sentences essentially, and then logically sentences into intentions so that it can then actually act on them. Um, <clears throat> the thing is, um, this means that certain sequences of things sequences of words, for example, make no sense. So you can discard them as being, well, they could be said, if you've ever heard Michael Palin speak sometimes, when he's off on one of his kind of ranting, using words that sound completely sensible, but actually don't make any sense. Um, but we all speak in incoherent sentences most of the time. So actually, the only ones you care about interpreting are ones where certain words follow. So they, you know, there's nouns and verbs that they have to follow in a certain order. So you can dispense with certain sequences because they aren't very likely to ever occur in reality or mean anything. The problem is that if I have um, my cooker hood going, it doesn't mean the telephone isn't going to ring. So in sound recognition, you might have a telephone ringing sound detection system, but, it, but that can happen at any point. Just because there's some other sound happening, it doesn't mean it, it, it's not going to happen. And another quality is um, that sound does not um, displace other things. And one of the things that happens with speech is that um, one of the early stages of the audio processing is 
to try and remove noise and to try try and remove the background so you're just left with the voice part um now with sound recognition generally speaking the background is the bit you want <laughs> um and so a lot of the techniques that are used for sound speech recognition are actually quite bad for us because they remove the sounds that we're interested in there's there's other factors for example when, we, when you break a window one of the things that happens is that you typically saturate the microphone i.e you, you you present it with more sound than it can deal with. And so you get this um, kind of, it's kind of a distortion, um, which is what you describe it as if you listen to it, but it's basically because the microphone was just overloaded with sound. Um, so there's lots of <clears throat> so little details that kind of make it different. And, but then fundamentally, I go back to this point that speech has a logical sequence where things make sense or they don't make sense and don't things that don't make sense can be discarded whereas with sound there's there's, there's kind of no understanding of you know just because your dog's barking doesn't mean your window's broken um uh it probably means your dog your dog might well bark after window's broken for example but it doesn't mean that just before beforehand they weren't either. there's this kind of no notion of of a of a sequence you you get you get sounds in any order and in any circumstance Awesome. Awesome. Very good. I think that was a actually a really good explanation of the difference between sound recognition and speech recognition. Um, so we have now piled up a couple questions or a few questions in, in the, in the YouTube chat. I'd like to take real quick. Um, the first one is from, I shot, let me see, actually from says Cesar. Uh, we told him we would take this one. So most bat echolocation, and I'll go as far as, you know, certain high frequency pitches, you know, as you get older, even your ear won't start to detect some of these high frequency pitches um, beyond the range of human hearing. Uh, do you also explore non-audible audio range as inputs for your ML models? Uh, we don't, but it's very clear that you can use the same, same kinds of ideas. One of the things that you'd need is you, um, most speech people and indeed we use um 16 kilohertz audio which basically sampled audio which means that we don't pick up sounds above eight kilohertz um if you want to go um uh you know higher than audible range or lower than audible range you you would need you would need to develop a, a you know some special front-end processing and, and and sample at higher rates or different rates to the ones we do but yeah it, it's certainly possible it's not something we do um but yeah you could use the same kinds of techniques Awesome. Okay. Here's another one. This one is from I shot JR and he's asking, and this, I think this, I think this was around the time when you were talking about your very expensive microphones. And I'm actually curious about this too, because if you're sampling something or creating data with this 3000 pound, 3000 quid microphone, um, you know, how, how, how are you going to be able to, you know, correlate this or match it to sounds that were generated from a $3 or a $10 microphone off the shelf? Um, so the question is, how do you accommodate for different mics, acoustic environments, et cetera? This goes a little good beyond question. that, but yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, the answer, uh, which I didn't go into, um, which I will now, is um, at a recent, well, probably a, a couple of years ago, we, we broke some windows in a house. We had 55 different devices recording at the same time, recording both inside and outside. Um, uh, this is why I say the data collection problem becomes quite interesting and quite challenging because um, if you if you take, I mean, this this hasn't got a microphone on it, but this is the kind of you know the sort of type of boardy type things that many of us who work in embedded and things end up dealing with. Um, if it's a microcontroller, we just said it doesn't have much resource. It certainly doesn't. I mean, this is actually quite powerful. It's got um, and it's got an SD card slot in it. But um, it, if you're recording audio, you're producing um, uh, what is it, thirty-two uh, thousand bytes a second of audio at sixteen kilohertz, sixteen bit. Um, you got to get it out somewhere, and if it's a microcontroller, you can't keep it on the microcontroller. You've got to get it off there, and if it's a Raspberry Pi, which we, we use quite extensively, you've got an SD card, but the SD card's behavior can be quite variable depending on the SD card manufacturer. We found that you know some SD cards work reliably well and some work very poorly to the extent that we don't use those anymore. Um, 
So yeah, we, we, we record in lots of different environments. Or well, we also have um, uh, a semi-anechoic space uh, and an also an anechoic, uh, anechoic chamber while we record. Um, and then we can use augmentation techniques to augment that with um, environments. So if you look on the internet, for example, you can go and get what's called the impulse response, which is the, the acoustic environment, sort of like if you imagine distilling the acoustic environment into a, like a little package, like a, like a I don't know, a, a sugar cube. The, that's what like the impulse response is to uh, a cavern. And you can get the sort of the impulse responses from things like the Sistine Chapel. So if you want to have a sound and make it sound like it, it occurred in the Sistine Chapel, you can basically take a completely pure anechoic recording of that and this impulse response and combine them in a clever way and end up with the sound that sounds like it occurred in the Sistine Chapel. So I have a uh, one, I think it's interesting, this right here, <laughs> Maybe we'll have to bring you on the show again here, Dominic, uh, where you're actually in one of these chambers and we're breaking some glass as a demo. I think that would be awesome. Uh, I shot JR, nailed it right there. Uh, pretty cool. Um, but I think uh, I think we covered all the questions here on the on the YouTube, huh, Alessandro? I should just point out, you know, that the, the smashing windows it is great fun. I'm not going to know. <laughs> um, but, but there are there are some health and safety issues that you need to be aware of. I'll leave it at that. that yeah. <laughs> that's important to note. Uh, one thing actually that we haven't asked, but maybe maybe Dominic knows, maybe he doesn't. Uh, so I'm just going to bring it up. Because I, I thought of this actually as an interesting point as well. So if you've used your data, we talked before about, um, you know, if, if a client or someone says, you have to remove all, your, all our recordings that you took in our home or whatever, um, you know, you have to like kind of go through your data set and remove all those uh, samples. What happens to the models that you've generated thanks to those uh, data samples? Do you have to like rework those models as well, or is do you, do you have any insights on that? Yeah, I mean that that that's happened. Um, is it? Uh, there's a there's a company. I I don't want to give the name because it's not. I can't quite recall what it's called. But there's a company in uh, America that did a whole bunch of scraping of web images off the internet and then had to throw away their model because yeah, they weren't permitted to use it. Now, I'm, that's that's a, an extreme example because kind of, you could probably see that one coming. Um, but, you know, if you think about gathering data, you, you, you do have to consider the fact that the model is, is a consequence of that data. You have to collect data as well with per explicit permission that that's what you're going to use it for. And, and you may run into trouble if you don't you know don't have those kinds of protections and it's one of the reasons why you know this this stuff gets quite quite tricky and it's not that just like the technical bit is tricky but the, the legal bit can be a bit of a minefield as well interesting so so okay. alessandra we had we had one more question i shot jr reminded us that we have this one um if we can real quick is that okay go ahead okay cool so yeah this this is the this is the actual last one so far uh, can you combine accelerometer data with audio to detect vibrations in addition to sonic vibrations? Uh, uh, it, it is possible. We don't do it uh, at the moment, but yes, yeah, yeah it, it is possible. Um, and it's it's clearly got a lot of applications where you can do things like that. I mean, um, we, we recently actually granted a patent on um, using sound recognition in various kinds of hearables where you're tracking the motion of someone alongside the sound that's being made oh, wow. and then inferring information from that. So you're giving context to sound, essentially. In, in the same way that sound can give context to images, you're now using something else to give some further context to the sounds that you can hear. Very cool. Cool. So I wanted to touch on, uh, we've got a short uh, actual demo of, of some of the stuff that you've worked on. Uh, but before that, I was I just wanted to tell everyone that you did a really awesome uh, talk at, um, at the TinyML UK uh, meetup, but it's available online on, uh, uh, I'll just share the link here. Um, one thing, you know, the talk was called, let me read, Making ML Work in the Real World, right? And I think it's a really interesting topic because uh, a lot of the stuff that I see uh, people working on or, or you know, uh, maybe people talking about is all kind of like lab-based stuff, right? Or or research-based stuff. Uh, but you know, Audio Analytic is one of the companies that's actually deploying stuff in the real world. 
So, you know, I'm curious to like take a short kind of, um, we don't have too much time, I was just looking at the clock. So maybe let's not go into too, too much detail, but, you know, if you were to say, what are the kind of main problems when you try to transfer uh, a model into a real world application? Uh, what are some of the things that you might want to think about? I think you've covered some of them already, but uh, just, you know, kind of a summary of, of your talk, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think the real things are you, you need to be aware that the model is only going to work in the environments that it's basically been built from, essentially. Um, so if you then take it out of those environments, it's then not going to work, or it might work, but it might not. And, and you've got two options. You can either test it, or you can start to try and gather data that covers those environments that you want it to work in. The second is that you, you kind of really need to understand what the use case is because that will determine what success means. Um, so the demo that we're going to see uh, is um, a baby cry detection. Um, if you think about baby cry, detecting the sound of baby cry, your opportunities for making mistakes are, is actually a relatively relaxed kind of environment because if you tell someone that their baby's crying and it turns out that they're not, um, it's a bit annoying. But if you think about the use case of a window being broken um, and maybe you're, we're in a world where you can actually go out to work again, um, if you're at work and you get a message on your phone saying your window's been broken, it's, it's a different kind of in, in mental kind of process that you're going to be going through, what you should be doing, how you should be responding. So um, different, prob different machine learning tasks have different um, notions of what successful means. I mean, similarly, you could say if you're labeling labeling people in a picture and putting names to them, like Facebook do, for example, it's a different there's there's a different threshold in terms of um, acceptable performance to face unlock where you really don't want it to ever mistake. You'd rather it didn't get it right and didn't let you in first rather than let just random people in. Hopefully, that's not too long or something. I was thinking. I was thinking real. Wait. I was thinking real quick, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard about this, but, and it's slightly off topic, but um, there's a, there's some people who are growing up now and, you know, becoming of age and, you know, in the era of digital um, photography and, and, um, and audio now collection, right? So, you know, these babies, you have, you have a baby crying, right? What happens in 18 years or, you know, 16 years when that baby is 18 and can now make decisions for him or herself, uh, what if they want that data pulled, you know? And I mean, now you've got oh, a whole different story. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I mean, I've got, um, I, I've gone through, I've gone through the period of, of my children. My youngest is now 17. So, uh, and my oldest is, um, just don't know if I can count that one, uh, 23. Um, so, um, you know, I've gone through that period where, there was a time where I could sign off and say, yeah, it's fine. You can record them because they're my children and they're small and what have you. But when they kind of became 18, I, I wasn't able to do that anymore. And and it also meant that it was more difficult for me to be able to do recording in, in the home because I couldn't be guaranteeing that they wouldn't be around. And, and if they've not given permission and I have, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't go. I think with the case of a baby growing up, and you know, the parents are making the decision for that child until they're 18. Yeah, I feel there have been stories where, you know, the adult, the, the the recent adult sues their parents for having taken pictures of them as a baby and posting it on, you know, something like Facebook. And so, like, it's, it, it I wonder what kind of problems are going to arise, right? I mean, this is yeah, all kind of new, I, right? I, Even in the last... Yeah, it is. It is. I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think I probably personally would be quite okay with someone recording me crying as a baby because um, I probably wasn't saying anything very intelligible. But you're right. I mean, later on, it, it, it might well be a problem. Uh, you know, yeah. Younger teenagers, it could be a big problem. Certainly. So should we actually uh, show the example of the baby crying or the baby detection monitor? Yeah, we should probably, um, probably have like a little disclaimer when I was warning. Yeah, fair so, warning. Yeah, parental work, work guideline warning. Yeah, if you are someone who has children of your own, you might find this marginally disturbing um, <laughs> because it's a baby crying. Um, <laughs> It, it does it does do something to parents um when we were do, when we first started doing baby cry there were a couple of people like me who are older and had children as well as some younger guys and 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 those ones of us who had children 
found it really difficult being in the office when these babies were crying all the time. Um, partly because some of them were clearly quite distressed babies, and, and that is quite quite an unpleasant thing. We also have that. It's, you know, another little anecdote. Yeah, one of those things that we get to do, like the breaking the windows. This is um, we we get. Um, we, we've had mothers bring their babies into the office to record them into the, or the, the um, anechoic space. And, and it's quite unnerving that actually mothers can do things to enforce their, make their babies cry, which is quite, a, <laughs> and they, they practiced <laughs> as well, which is slightly unnerving. <laughs> we could laugh about it, but it's probably pretty sad. You're just like, oh, they took his toy away. <laughs> <laughs> Took out a pacifier. Yeah. All right. Okay, disclaimer. So disclaimer. There you go. I'll, I'll try to keep the sound low <laughs> for yeah. anyone watching, but uh, but yeah, disclaimer uh, done. So let's play it for science. So so what we what we were using was an NXP board that's got a Cortex M0 Plus on it, and you're going to see it, it's running. There's a little green light flashing. It goes red when the baby cries. It takes a moment or two. There's the baby. And there's it's gone there. And then when the baby stops crying, because uh, we turn it off, um, it'll go back to green again. Now, obviously, you know, changing an LED. Yeah, there we go. Moment of panic that it wasn't going to change. <laughs> Even though I've seen that video like a hundred times. <laughs> I know the ending. Um, uh, you know, it, it changing, changing an LED is, is obviously pretty naughty. Uh, but, you know, as soon as you put a network connectivity on the end of it or some way of communicating off, um, you start to see that, that, that you can do things, and 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 that was baby cry. But if you imagine any sound you can hear from sirens to jet planes to cars to, to to literally anything, you can start to make sense of the world around you. Very very interesting. So I know that there are a couple of anecdotes that you've you've mentioned in the past that are quite interesting around sound detection, right? And and kind of weird sounds that uh, have come up in your uh in your when you were testing the device right like on the field in the field uh do you mind sharing a couple of those because some of them are like really interesting uh and things that you don't think about and i think it, you know relating back to the concept of you really have to think about your model or your use case um and what what's what's acceptable and what's not right i think that's uh so going back to that point i guess can you yeah. share some of the anecdotes that, that you shared in the past yeah, I mean, these are, these are definitely in the fingers burnt category. Um, so we had a, an interesting scenario where um, we were getting some smoke alarm detections uh, in France. Now, the thing was, they weren't smoke alarms. They were actually a parrot. Um, <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is that France has a much higher proportion of bird ownership than uh, many other countries, like, for example, the US, which has more bird owners. but it's six well five six times the population uh and yet it's only like 50 percent more bird owners and it turns out that this parrot in the south of france sounds like one of our smoke alarms i mean we've got like 200 different smoke alarms in the office that we sound from time to time um uh yeah we have low battery problems as well as you can imagine that when there's a low battery that that can be quite frustrating when you've got four boxes of smoke alarms <laughs> um yeah, so I mean that's that's kind of one <clears throat> funny anecdote about about these kinds of things. I got another one that's a that's a real kind of software-y one, um, which which entertain which entertains me. Um, so uh, we were looking at a baby cry model, and uh, it it was it was performing okay, and then uh, one of my colleagues discovered that there was a bug in the code, and that rather than actually feature feeding the feature value into the model. We were featuring the address of the feature into the model because this is secret. Wow. So just a number, you can do anything you like with it. Um, and so we fixed it, and the model got worse. <laughs> so we were feeding real data in, it was worse. So, uh, yeah, they, they, these are a few of the entertaining little anecdotes of machine learning in the real world. There, there was another one that you mentioned once about. Um, uh, well, actually, I guess, I guess you touched on it before, like the fact that, you know, depending on what um, what you're trying to detect, in some cases, you're actually, it's better, you're better off not detecting it if you're unsure, 
than detecting it, right? So like you mentioned before the face unlock and yeah. uh, you know, versus the baby crying. Uh, the other one is the fire alarm also. Like, you know, you might you might get annoyed if, if every time you leave the house, the fire alarm go, you know, the fire alarm detector goes off. Um, so that's a really interesting one. And, you know, you mentioned, I can't remember, there was once uh, something you mentioned about like a, a truck um, kind of uh, reversing in the, in the alleyway uh, that kind of like some sounds that I guess got recorded in combination with, uh, with your, with whatever sound you were trying to record. Right. And then when you go play it back, uh, you know, the machine learning detects that as a as a potential kind of um, cause of the sound of the. I, yeah, I can't remember exactly the use case. Yeah, no, I, I'm not. I'm not. I, it's not not springing to me exactly what scenario you're talking about. But but certainly, um, let's take take the baby cry example because it's really interesting that that when a baby's crying, um, you have that vocalization. Wah! You know, uh, we can all. You know, get to practice our baby cries, um, <laughs> but in between you've got breaths, and and when you're labeling, when you're labeling baby cry, it's quite important that you understand which bits you need to label with what, because if you um, label the breathy part, then you can start to detect certain breathy sounds as though they're baby cries, because they're labeled as baby cries. So the model is quite reasonably saying. I heard something that qualifies in this baby cry category. So it's a baby cry. Um, and then there's also some other noises that babies make. And, and going back to the data question, which I know we've, we've probably flogged a bit, but um, there are times when you're listening to something, you can't actually determine what it actually is. You can't make a decision because just by hearing it, you can't you can't tell, tell what it is. Um, some sounds. Uh, I give you an example. If you listen to a bus station and a railway station together, uh, you may not be able to tell which is which just by the sound. And if you think about it, that's not really a great surprise because quite often there are buses near tra railway stations. So, you know, it, it, I mean, some you can clearly, but other ones, it, it, it can be very difficult. So um, some of the things we think sound like a particular sound are actually not just the sound there are actually other knowledge that we're using and that's where we get into that whole contextual question of taking different sensors and putting them together and going oh actually you know i can hear this but i'm no i'm here in this location so actually it's a thing so 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 i, so I, I want to be conscious of time, time here, here. Uh oh what uh -oh. did i do i have a bit of an echo did i all right it's fine um so uh here we go conscious of time uh, we have to close this out in just a few minutes, but I'm, I'm looking at the chat here. It looks like n with through innovation coffee, not only did you get a new name, but you also got a new title. They're calling you Mr. Pink smasher of windows. So, <laughs> so that's that you could take that alias. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, so yeah, I mean, as we usually do at the end of each of these episodes, you get an opportunity to kind of let our viewers know your call to action for them. Shameless plug, whatever you'd like to say here in the last couple minutes before we close this episode out. So um, as the floor has already been yours, it's yours once again to, to plug whatever you'd like. So, yeah, I mean, so, so basically, uh, you know, we, we look at a consumer tech sound recognition type applications. If that's, that's an area you're in, then, then do come and talk to us. We'd love to love to talk to you. Um, I think in terms of kind of machine learning um, that, uh, you know, we, we, we advise people to, to, to start to look at it uh, and, and not be frightened of it, but also keep expectations real. And, and one other thing I think that both Alessandro and I would like to say is obviously if you're in the UK area, please do, do get in touch with uh, TinyML UK. Uh, we've got a meetup group, so just go and search for that. If you're not in the UK area, there are TinyML meetup groups all around the world, all through Europe. There's one in Africa, there's ones in Asia, there's ones in America. Uh, I, think the, I don't think there's one in South America at the moment, but maybe that's your opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, do do look, look those up. There's some great talks by people like Pete Warden from Google. Um, there's Eben Upton from Raspberry Pi Foundation there. There's lots lots of good. There's lots of good talks from lots of different people. Maybe some of them you haven't heard of, but there's a few big names like Massimo and, and Eben that, that kind of are big draws. Awesome. And yeah, we've shared uh, your, your link here. So audioanalytic.com. Go check that out. It will be in the description. Highly recommend following them on Twitter forward slash or at audioanalytic. Check that out. And um, I mean, 
uh, Alessandro, I'm going to let him close out the episode, but you know, Dominic, thank you so much for your time today and uh, everyone watching. Thank you so much for, for your time and all of your questions. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Alessandro over to you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm just going to echo that. Thank you so much, Dominic, for joining us. And I'm going to uh, invite everyone again to watch this uh, video that Dominic gave at the Tiny ML UK meetup, um, talking about exactly, you know, what are the things that you need to think about when you're uh, moving your model to a real world scenario, right? I think uh, he he did share some of that today, but the, he does go in a bit more depth in that talk. So uh, if you're interested, if that's something, you know, if you are building a product, if you are interested in, in, uh, going to production with a model, then maybe these are things that you should uh, consider. With that, again, Dominic, thank you so much. And thank you to all our viewers for being online and uh, and um, watching this episode today. And maybe we'll have to come back for that window smashing episode. I'll see what Yeah. <laughs> special, special appearance, we'll do that. That's awesome, thank you. All and right. A big, a big cheers to everyone. Cheers, thank you. Thank yeah. you.